Hi guys, today we are going to be talking about Renderer 3D. Let's get to it. Let's pull in a Fusion Comp under Effects. Track that in there. Let's go to Fusion page. Okay, let's bring in the Renderer 3D. Connect that to Media Out and drag that to the right viewer. Nothing shows because there's no input here. Let's bring in the Shape 3D. Let's make it a cube. Let's drag this to the left viewer. Let's uncheck lock width and height. Let's increase the width of it like that. Let's connect that to Render 3D. And we see this showing. Let's rotate this cube sideways a little bit. So we go to Shape 3D, go to Transform, and swivel this on the Y axis just a little bit like that. And let's reduce the size of the little bit. Okay. Let's swivel it a little bit more. We will see the other edge there. Okay, good. Now you see everything is white. So let's go to Renderer 3D. Renderer 3D basically has two inputs, the mask input and then the 3D mesh that you connect to it. It basically converts 3D to 2D, something that you can now um, use on your edit page. If I decide to pull in a mask node like this box here, let me connect this to the Renderer 3D. It, of course, limits the area where it will display what the Renderer 3D is rendering, right? That's just typical mask behavior. Now let's go to the settings for Renderer 3D. By default, if I decide to bring a camera node in here and I connect that to this, and some zoom it out a bit. Okay. We have one camera here and I bring another camera and I connect this to that. And this camera here, I pull it back a whole lot more like that. And the 3D by default uses the first camera. But if I go here and I go to camera 3D1, you see it's the same view here. If I go here and I click on camera 3D2, you see the second camera that I pulled out a whole lot. That's how that works. You could even animate, you could go to Render 3D and animate this, right? You can go here and animate that you should switch to camera 3D1, 3D2 at certain times of the timeline when it's playing. That's all down to you. That's that for camera. Here, typically, mono is what is selected by default for Render 3D. But if you are doing stereoscopic rendering, you can pick the left eye, the right eye and stacking, all right? But I won't talk about that. Let's just move on. Reporting by default, leave all this ticked. Report warnings, these are self-explanatory. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. Then here we come to renderer. We have three renderer engines in here. Um, I've searched online to see if I can actually add another third-party rendering engine, but so far, no luck. So back, let's talk about this. By default, when you pull a renderer node in, software renderer is what is listed. Now, the difference between software renderer and OpenGL renderer is this. For OpenGL renderer, it is faster because it uses the G GPU. Software renderer is slower because it uses the CPU. But if you are rendering transparent objects, transparent 3D objects, or you are rendering shadows in your comp, it is advisable to use software renderer. The results are consistent across systems and the shadows are more accurate. For OpenGL, the shadows and transparency can be inaccurate and inconsistent depending on the GPU type that you have, all right? That's basically the difference between OpenGL renderer and software renderer. This OpenGL UV renderer is basically used to render out, if you have created like a texture on this box, for example, and you want to render it out as a flat image that you can later on bring into a 3D comp to wrap the image with. This is how you do it. Let me give you an example. Let's go here go to controls, set this to sphere, right? And let's bring in a map node. So I brought this in now. This is a texture. So if I connect this to that, connect this to this, and I drag this to the viewer, we have this wrapped around this. Let's assume that we actually created all this in Fusion and we connected that to Shape 3D. We can go to Renderer 3D and pick UV Render. You see that UV Render unfurls, like unwraps the texture. 
So it's more or less like what we are bringing in. All right. So that's what the UV map is for if you want to create your own texture that you want to wrap around a 3D object. Let's um, delete that. Let's set this back to software renderer. Okay. That's the difference between OpenGL renderer and software renderer. And let's move on. Output channels. Now, here comes the interesting part. By default, RGB is selected. Let me select the first camera so we have this view. RGBA channel is selected. That, that's essentially the object. So if I uncheck it, the object disappears. There are instances where we don't want to render out the object. We just want to render out the Z channel. The Z channel is the depth channel. I'm sure you are familiar with depth map. Depth map. This is um, renderer 3D rendering the depth information from this scene here, right? If you go to, so I tick this back. To render the depth information, let me give you an instance where you may need to render the depth information. Let's connect, let's change this back to cube. Before we go to this, let's go to lighting, then I'll come back to this, all right? If we go to lighting, enable lighting, everything becomes black because there is no light in the scene. I pull in, sorry, I pull in the spotlight, I connect that to match 3D, and I click on the spotlight, increase the cone angle, go to transform, and I increase the position like that. Now, the position we have increased, let's go to, I'll make it linear so it's more interesting, something like this. All right, so we have this view here. Then you can also enable shadows. This is a self explanatory. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Under, if I go here and I pick OpenGL renderer. Now, before we go to the Z, um, this output channels, I'm going to talk about all of this. Anti aliasing, this is just when you want to smooth in, don't want to have jagged edges. Typically, I don't touch this. I'm not going to talk too much about this. The default settings appear to be fine. Um, some people would want to reduce this from three to one because three essentially means that when it is rendering it, it will first sample the image at three times its current resolution and downscale it back to achieve a level of smoothness. But I typically leave it as default, right? And um, I move on from there. I just leave this by default. Then I go to accumulation effects. Let's collapse anti aliasing. If you go to accumulation effects and enable it, this completely slows down the system. So it's usually advisable when you are using depth of field, you, you need to really have a powerful system because it's really slow, right? So I could, um, this, the depth of field this image shows is based on the camera. Let's drag this image to this view. Let's pull out a bit, go to like 50. Probably 25. So you see the camera, you see the object. If I go to the camera and I go to controls and I go to control visibility and I click on focal plane, you'll see where the focus plane is. I can move this back to the part to this part of the box so that this part is in focus. I can do that by going to camera and this focal plane here, reducing it. And I'm watching, I'm watching this side, I'm watching this side to see when it gets in focus. And we have that. So you see that this is in focus and that gently defocuses. That's how you do depth of field in Renderer 3D. But because this is so intensive, most often we you look for workarounds for it. So which is where I'm going to come back now. Let's now uncheck accumulation effects. We come back to now depth information. If I decide to export depth information, I can bring in shift spacebar depth blur. Connect this to depth blur. And let's drag depth blur to the left side. And I decide to increase the blur size of the depth blur. You will notice that Gradually, these edges are becoming defocused, and this one has focus based on the depth information that we're having here. There are other ways to do this. I can delete this. I can bring in a Luma Kia, connect this to the Luma Kia, 
Then under the marquee, I can go to channel and bring the depth node. Now, before we can actually get, if I drag this to the left view, and nothing shows. Before we can get the depth information, we have to tell the marquee where the near part is and where the farther part is. So I'm going to go to here, the near plane. I'm going to drag the sample and go to, to, to this part, drop that there. And then the far plane, I'm going to go here and go and drop that there. So we have this information. Then we bring in a bitmap node and connect this to the bitmap node. If you drag the bitmap node to the viewer, we have that, which is which is what we want to go to and pick luminance. And then we have, this is the depth information. I think I've done this in a video before. I'll refer to you to the video in my description, how to do a depth of field. Someone asked about it and I kind of did it in that video. I'll put it in the description. Um, then I uncheck this. I won't talk about all of this. I will get to vector. Vector, I won't demonstrate it, but I'll tell you what it does. In render node under settings, there's a motion blur option. This is extremely slow and system intensive. If I enable it and I do a movement here, it's really slow. So typically what the workaround for it is to enable vector, and then you can bring in what we call a vector blur, put it in there, and then you can determine how much motion blur applies to the movement that is coming through from the renderer 3D. All right, so that's how that works. And um, so basically that is that for renderer 3D, this image part, you can set the width and height of the image you're exporting and all that and the depth information too, you can determine it. I usually just leave this as default, except if I see that the output is there's a banding, I can increase it to float 16 or float 32. And um, Android 3D is pretty straightforward. And I hope um, you learned one or two things on this one. Thanks for watching and have a nice one. Cheers.